Okay, good morning. My name is Chris Walker. Um, some people call me Dr. Walker. I prefer to Chris Walker. Um, we have this debate of creation versus evolution. And I'm not real sure why it's a debate, um, but it seems to, to fill the halls of academics as well as the halls of the churches because there's this perceived conflict between the two. Uh, what I want y'all to do for me this morning is to be interactive. I want you to have an opinion. So, does anybody have an opinion about creation, creationism, or evolution? Okay, will, will somebody hold a hand up for me and say, I'm an evolutionist? How about somebody hold a hand up for me and say, I'm a creationist? Okay, I got some creationists. No evolutionists. I'm a creationist. I'm also a Darwinian evolutionist. And I see no conflict between the two. Which, most people on, on either side of this debate would then say, well, you're an idiot. Because because they're mutually exclusive. And, and I would say, no, they're not. So, the creationists, people who, nobody's willing to step out and say they're, they're a Darwinian evolutionist. Is that correct? Okay. Those of you who said you're a creationist, we get our account of creation from Genesis. Can somebody tell me what Genesis tells us God created in terms of life. Come on, guys. It's not going to work if you won't interact with me. I mean, if you believe creation, what did God create? It says, uh, and God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock creatures that move along the ground, and wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Okay. What did he create? Kinds. It says it over and over and over. So what's a kind? We've all read it. We say we believe in creation. We all, those of us who are creationists, say, I've read the scriptures, I've read Genesis. If we look a little further in Genesis to post the flood, we again see that God says to Noah, come off of the ark with all of the animals, each by kind. So what's a kind? Species. Species. Okay. What's a species? Types. A group that can interbreed is species. So, so it would be okay to say, according to Genesis, God created groups that are capable of interbreeding. Um, there's at least 16 different definitions that I'm aware of of species. Um, your biology teacher probably uses Ernst Meyer's definition, which says it's a population of animals capable of reproducing and having reproductively viable offspring. So as to exclude hybrids where they can reproduce, but their offspring can't reproduce. The example usually used is horses breeding with donkeys, producing mules, but the mules are sterile. Okay? So, do we think kind is a 
equivalent to species. Okay. Species is actually defined by Linnaeus, Carl von Linnaeus, 1759, wrote a manuscript in Latin called System Naturae, where he came up with this idea of binomial nomenclature, which is how we name animals. We humans are homo sapiens. And he came up with what is known as the Linnaean hierarchy. And to, to give you an idea as to how important this is to me, my third son's name is Linnaeus, okay? So Linnaeus is my biological hero here. So can anybody help me with the Linnaean hierarchy of classification, systematics? Come on, biology, you're not going to be happy. What, what do we have, kingdom? Phylum. Species, okay. I'm going to use a different word for subspecies. I'm going to call it race. Can we go any further? Organism. Mm, the organism. Okay, individual. Okay, individual is going to be the bottom. Okay. Well, that, we'll have race. Let's go with community. And then, not this family, but family, okay? I.e. people that you're directly related to. Parents, siblings, children, cousins. That's more related than community, right? So we're talking about relationships, particularly when we get here. So we go from individual to my immediate biological family to the community that I'm a part of to the race, which could be mixed with community, to species. And species is binomial, right? Genus and specific epithet. Where is kind in the Linnaean hierarchy? We had a suggestion that it was species. Could you maybe help us? Okay, look, my, I've been years. I, ninth grade, the last time I thought about biology. So maybe brief definition of kingdom phylum class. I, I, I'm, I'm assuming I may not be the only one who's not entirely. I, I, I remember that, but I, didn't, I can't remember how to get distinguish between all of us. Well, it's. And, and that's part of the problem, okay, is, is we, add, we add expected knowledge to words that we don't really know the definitions to, which is why I, why I wanted to get a definition of species, okay? As we go up this hierarchy, the groups get larger and larger and larger, but their group, according to Linnaeus, um, almost entirely by the morphology. In other words, they look more like one another. Now, understanding, Linnaeus put together this system in 1759, and Darwin and Alfred Wallace don't come up with the theory of evolution until 1858, and Ernst Meyer doesn't come up with his definition of a species until 1942. But Linnaeus, so, so in answer to your question, kingdoms are the really big group. Like we plant, have plants, plants we have animals. animals. Yeah. So there's now eight recognized kingdoms, and, and most of those kingdoms, we don't have a good understanding of what those things are anyway, so it's hard to, it's hard to discuss without being specific. But, but, but you've got protists and you've got monerans and you've got sponges have now been given their own kingdom because they're so 
different from everything else. Okay? Class is something that we recognize very simply. If, if we come into if we come into those more human-like groups here, so our phylum is chordata, meaning we have a nervous system or a central nervous system. Our subphylum is vertebrata, meaning we have a bone encased central nervous system. And then the classes are those recognizable animals that we can get. Aves being the birds, mammalia being the mammals, reptilia being the reptiles. Okay? So those are our big groups. And then in orders, <coughs> those are the, are the, again, the divisions within each of those classes and the families are the divisions within those orders. So for example, I'm, I'm a mammalogist, I'm a carno carnivorologist actually, so my class that I've studied is mammalia. My order is carnivora. My family that I'm most versed in is the felidae or the cats. And then there's multiple genera within that class, within that family, Felidae, and in some cases, multiple species within each genera. Back up to high school biology. That helps, thanks. Okay. Okay, so, so what I want to do here is I want each of you to be able to think about possibilities of what you believe and why you believe it. Now I want to ask the question again. Linnaeus didn't give us a scriptural kind in his categories, but he worked very diligently to figure out all of the different categories of life on the planet, right? We have one suggestion that species is equivalent to kind. Anybody else want to pick something off of that list and say, hmm, that might have been the kind. All right, let me ask you this question. If I had a picture up here that had dogs, dogs, wolves, jackals, coyotes, foxes in, in one corner, in the other corner of this picture I had a lion and a mountain lion and an ocelot and a house cat. And in the middle of the picture, I had a horse and a donkey and a mule and a zebra. How many kinds of animals are up there? Three. Three? Or, I mean, I listed way more than three, right? Well, those, those kinds are families, according to Linnaeus. Okay? So we have the Felidae, we have the Canidae, we have the Cabellidae, we have different kinds of animals, and, and that's my interpretation of what the scriptures call kinds, is the family unit. Interestingly, where are the missing links that we hear about? on this scale. Are there missing links? Can we see actual evidence of descent from one species to another species within, for example, the Felidae? Can we see relationships that are documentable, observable by science down here? And the answer is absolutely yes. So we can look at relationships genetically and morphologically, and I'm going to stick with the cats because the cats I know the best. For example, cheetahs. Y'all know what a cheetah is, right? Of the other cats that you know of, what animal looks, what other cat looks like a cheetah? Is there one? Leopard, they're spotted. Ocelot spotted. That's just the that's just the outside of, of the animal, right? If we look at the morphology, if we look at the skeletal structure, if we look at the the 
ability of the animal to run quickly and the, and the way the bones and muscles are put together, cheetahs are very, very similar to the North American pumas or mountain lions. And if we look at that genetically, we see that cheetahs and mountain lions are much more like one another than they are the other cats. But they're still more like the other cats than they are like the dogs or the other carnivores. Okay? So, <coughs> where we have missing links in the fossil record and in genetics is between the orders and the families. The families being the separate entities, and I would argue the families are the created kind that God made. Have I let you out on a limb or getting ready to cut it off yet? Anybody? How many people do we have in here? I'm looking for this interaction, so y'all be bear with me, okay? How many people do we have in here that are drivers, drive automobiles? Okay, most of you. How many of you are getting ready for Christmas, Thanksgiving, Christmas holidays? Everybody's ready for the holidays. Okay, of the drivers, one of the things we do before Christmas is we go shopping, right? Everybody goes shopping. Someone, what's your name? Logan. Logan? How do you spell that word shop? Yeah, uh, no, S-H-O-P. S-H-O-P, okay. And when you're driving and you come to a green light, what do you do? Oh, stop, go, go, sorry. <laughs> 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 sorry. <laughs> so what's the point of that? I just led you out on a limb and made you believe something that was absolutely false and you knew it was false. All right? So I've gone through this whole talk this morning so far and said God created the Linnaean family and it's the kind that we see in Genesis. Where's the fallacy? Well, where did all those others come from? Up there? Where did all those other uh, families? All these other groups? Well, if we're, if we're from a creationist standpoint, we're saying God created families. And what, what we haven't said is, how do we get from families to all the different species? That's what I call <coughs> that big, ugly word. That's where the evolution occurs. <coughs> the created types are what God created. Let's go. And then we've got these other groups that are good groups. Linnaeus recognized them as being good groups because they're more like members of their group than they are like the other groups. So if God created this, why do we have those similarities and those other groupings that we can do up above? That, that's your question, right? Okay. Do we have any art connoisseurs in here? Somebody's got to be an art There we go. Art connoisseur. Okay. Do you know Da Vinci? Okay. Do you know Da Vinci's work, The Last Supper? Okay. Do you know Da Vinci's work, the Mona Lisa. Okay? Most of you know those, those art pieces, right? Mm -hmm. If we look at those art pieces, the Mona Lisa looks nothing like the Last Supper. But if we know Da Vinci and we look at the Last Supper, we can then look at the Mona Lisa and say there's lots of similarities in how this art was created. Why? Um. But 
why are they the same? They have a common they have the same creator. artist. They have a common creator, <coughs> right? So we expect similarities because of commonality of creation, because of commonality of the creator. And yet, if in fact I'm right, which I'm not arguing that I'm right, this is my opinion, okay? That this is the created unit, and this unit was created with sufficient variation so that it could evolve into these different units over time, we expect these different units <coughs> to have commonality, similarity, because they had a common creator, not just a common ancestor, which is what the pure evolutionists would argue. So anything below family has both a common creator and a common ancestor. But anything above family doesn't have common ancestor but has common creator. Questions about that? Am I making any sense here? Okay. Go, going back to our Da Vinci example, if I had the original Mona Lisa up here, the painting, and you were to look at it. You never met Da Vinci. Is there any question in your mind that there was a painter? That that, that, that painting did not just occur. There's no, no possibility that it happened, right? So, by virtue of its existence, we can infer, and properly so, that there must in fact be an artist. There must in fact be a creator. If we do the same thing with life on the planet, even when we get into the details of genetics, the, the very existence of a soccer player screams that there's got to be a creator. It screams it. Right? I mean, nobody thinks that, that the athletes that we see or the animals that we see or the trees that we see just happened. So why is there all this hoopla about evolution and evolutionists and people saying, oh, it didn't happen, it got created. It didn't get created, it evolved. Is there an issue there? Well, there's pre... I, I, I want to push forward a little bit. There's presupposition, <coughs> right? Okay. So you need to presuppose, you know, and, and, and the most basic level, the most basic question would be, is the supernatural real, or is there anything beyond the material world? One of the most basic questions we can answer, I would argue. So if I presuppose that the answer to that question is no, how do I explain what we have? Right? I might have to have a material process to explain the diversity of the world we live in. If I presuppose the answer is yes, then suddenly I've got some other options to work with. And the options, give me your options. Quick well, well, even if, even if I presuppose it's only a material world, I mean, just to make things interesting, I mean, we, we can say, okay, well, somehow this alien race came along and seeded the planet. Or we can talk about bubble universes. I mean, there's, there's a lot of conversations there. But once you allow for a, something beyond the material world, then we start getting in the conversation about a creator, being a spiritual being, supernatural. Right. So, so that's the most, so you've got to answer that question. And once you answer that, then these other things start falling out. And, and the argument is always, I need something reproducible, studyable. Because the scientific method depends on something that we can reproduce given a certain set of circumstances in a laboratory setting, right? 
that's the desire. It's frequently I mean, un, un, unattainable. Yeah. And, and that's and that's the problem with the argument. Okay. Is that we've got a set of facts that we can't reproduce, but we've also got a set of things, material things, that are evidence of, of, of one or the other, or maybe maybe multiple options of, of uh, origins. Well, it, 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 I don't <coughs> have the interaction you want. I don't want to No, no, I, I, I want all the but, interaction but you want to give. I, I would prefer it from the students. But yeah, yeah, well, maybe they're awake. I'm going to try to wake them up. Or they're asleep. I'm going to try to wake them up a little bit. Um, so, of course, one of the issues we get to is how do we know what we know? Right? Observations, right? So you've got the scientific method, which is a set of processes that assume, have, have a certain set of assumptions. You know, another way to, when you have a situation that you can't reproduce in a laboratory setting, then you've got to have another set of ways of knowing. Right? Right. So another option would be to use more of a historical perspective, which, 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 you know, how do we know George Washington lived, right? None of us were there to see it. We can't reproduce it in a test tube. Or, I mean, we've got to lock this here in theory. I guess we could, when, you know, when you guys get advanced enough in science classes, maybe we can do that. But that was like a joke, but it wasn't funny. Um, <laughs> tough crowd. So you kind of got, you got that. And then you got, the, of course, Christians are going to say one of the ways we know is by revelation, the idea that God speaks to his world and gives, actually gives us knowledge. Listen, keep going. You're doing well, good. Well, you're, 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 I think you're walking yourself out on a limb that I'm good. Good. Well, just, no, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I hope we play this game all day long. But we, this is Dr. Walker and our friends. We do this. Um, and, and so the question then becomes, uh, and really what I'm trying to do is put some energy into your argument a little bit and, and, and relate it in such a way that we can understand what's going on. So the question becomes, where do we get our knowledge to figure this kind of stuff out, right? And, and what do we do, what do we use to verify that the knowledge that we have is actually accurate? Yes. And, and that would be the basis of science. How do we, how do we and, test? And, and scientists want to come up with hypotheses that they can then throw their methodology at to prove their hypothesis is right. Or right. Okay? So, so the scientists want evolutionists. Let me, let me, let me make sure we, we're saying scientists are evolutionists. Okay? Because that's the general belief. Okay? Um, we want some way whereby we can go into a laboratory and prove that things have evolved. You know, I didn't do it... I may just come up with a species definition. I think we work originally started with kind, but but what does that word mean? Evolution. And is it something testable? <coughs> Somebody take a stab at it. What's evolution? Like the theory that um, organisms have evolved over time. They've changed. 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 Change is very characteristic of the population from generation to generation. So. Say that again. A change, a continuing process of change from one state or condition to a, to another or from another to another. Okay. So, so evolution is. Short definition, change. Things change, and we have this idea of time thrown in there. So over time, things aren't static. And, and most creationists will argue that God created species, and they're static. They never change. Uh, a fruit fly was a fruit fly when God made it, and it's still a fruit fly today. Okay? So let's look at some data, and I picked fruit fly for a, a really interesting example. How many of you have been to Hawaii? Okay. 
What do you know about the Hawaiian Islands? How were they formed? Volcanoes. Okay, so we have we have these two plates on the ocean floor, and there's a hot spot here, and it blows up, and it makes an island that then drifts off somewhere, and then another one blows up, and we have a new island created. That's how the Hawaiian Islands form. Okay, and, and we know that because it's observable. Okay, each time one of those islands is created, it's got altitude, significant altitude. It's volcanic but it's got no life. So the only way new life forms end up on islands in this scenario is colonization. Things from other islands colonize them. Fruit fly. <coughs> favorite model species of geneticists, Drosophila. The reason it's a favorite is they only have four chromosomes, so they're pretty easy to study. Okay, along comes, this is our new island. Again, it's got altitude. Fruit flies don't do well at altitude. Fruit flies come and colonize here from some nearby island. They get blown over. They ride on a floating stick something. When they get here, young population, not many individuals, not much genetic variation. They don't like altitude, so they start growing their population around the island. Static species, right? They're the same. When they get around the island and the two populations, again, we're talking many, many generations before they spread out and get all the way around the island. What do y'all think happens right here? They're still fruit flies, right? What? Interbreeding. Except they can't. There's so many generations away from one another by the time they get to the other side of the island that by Ernst Meyer's definition of species, they're no longer capable of interbreeding. Okay? And yet, if we go from here and chase these populations around the island all the way around, We have no problem interbreeding between all those subpopulations. So we have a species continuum. We have evidence of change over a relatively short amount of time to the point that <coughs> using Meyer's definition of species, this population and this population are different species. Uh oh. Proof of evolution. But it's down here. What did not happen was when they got here, one of them was a horsefly and the other was a dragonfly. They're both still Drosophila. They're both still in the same genus. They're very recognizable as such. Anybody that gets a sample of one of them in a genetics lab is going to say these are both Drosophilids. But they've changed. Evolution has occurred. And that is what led Darwin and Alfred Wallace, the Darwinian evolutionists, to conclude that if this type of change can occur, there's no reason that it shouldn't be vertical all the way through Linnaeus's hierarchy of the different types of animals. And yet we don't see any transitional forms above the level of family, which is what I use to support my argument that the creative type is family. What do you mean by that? We don't see any transitional forms. We see, we, 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 we have 
readily documentable via genetics, via fossils, via extant populations. Extant means they're still alive, okay, rather than extinct. Connections between species, between genera of evolved types, types that are newly created. Okay? I'm, I'm mixing words there. Newly created and evolved, I'm saying the same thing. Okay? Where we don't see any transitional forms, either genetically or in the fossil record, is outside of this group. <coughs> Does everybody with me on that? I want to make sure we understand. Mm -hmm. We haven't got plants turning into animals. We don't have plants turning into animals. I mean, that's way up here in kingdom, right? The difference between plants and animals. Okay? And we don't have we don't have amoebans turning into multi-celled mammals. Okay, we don't we don't see any evidence for that. And the fossil record, which is what evolutionists today will point to and say, we've got this beautiful continuum of geologic time and fossils. It doesn't exist, unfortunately. It's pieced together around the world, and if we, if we talk about geology, do we have any geologists in here? One? Yeah, can you tell us what conformity is in rocks? Well, conformity is where all of the orders maintain their order. So they've got, I mean, going from Precambrian all the way to the whatever. Precambrian to Cambrian <coughs> to Ordovician to Pennsylvanian right. to Mississippi, and then you go right on up the July. So they'd all be in order according to time. Right. Okay, that's conformity. What's not conformity? That'd be where there's a gap. There's a gap. Where you would go straight from Precambrian to Jurassic or something like that. Okay, and and so when we when we have Cambrian with Jurassic sitting on top of it, and we have a nonconformity, a gap in time, the geologist answer to that is always time and erosion. Okay, and there's always evidence if time and erosion removed those layers that we couldn't see. I'm pushing you. What's paraconformity? Paraconformity is the same thing without the evidence of any erosion. And if we if we go and take, and I, I would encourage each and every one of you if you have an opportunity to go to the Grand Canyon and walk from the base of it to the rim and look at the fossils because it's awesome. The problem with it is there's paraconformity after paraconformity after paraconformity conformity as you climb that wall. Millions of years, 25, 30 million years missing out of the record in the Grand Canyon that get put back together from other locations around the planet to build the entire geologic scale. But if we have a complete scale, we should have millions of transitional species linking these separate groups if evolution actually runs the gamut from kingdom all the way into view. And we have them below family, which is where, again, Alfred Wallace and Charles Darwin developed their theories, their theories of evolution. For you newcomers, I'm looking for interactions, so please speak up, including faculty. So can anybody tell me what model species Darwin used? What, what was it? The finches. Okay, what did he see? What did he observe in the finches? The different shapes of the beak. The different shapes of the beak. Okay. Um, do you know any more than that? Or is that? Some of them, if they ate fruit, would have a certain beak. And some of them would have insects. 
Okay, so so we had we had different beat shapes, observable different beat shapes in the finch population that were specific to diet. Okay, we had seed eaters, we had insectivores, we had fruit eaters. Okay, did we have any eagles, buzzards, or ducks, crows? What did we have? A whole bunch of finches. They started out as finches, they ended up as finches, but they ended up with different beak structures. And, and, and if we look at the finches that are in South America, which, is, which are the founding populations of those Galapagos finches, okay, all of those beak types exist in the parent populations. So what we have in the Galapagos with Darwin's finches is really nothing more than, than a sieve, the environment in this case, that sorted the beak types into those that were successful versus those that were unsuccessful. Darwin would call that survival of the fittest. <laughs> if you have a beak for eating soft fruit and there's nothing but acorns on the island, you're going to die because you can't break the acorns open with your fruit-eating beak. Right? So we evolve. So let's, let's go back to how do, we get, how do we get sufficient variation within that parent population to have something to run through this sieve to select upon for survival of the is to start taking it. Mutation. That's that's the evolutionist thing. Okay? That a mutation occurs that somehow benefits the individual, and that mutation moves into the population at such frequency that it takes over the population and you now have a new species that contains that mutation. We get enough time to play math. What time do we have to get out of here? We got forty minutes. Okay. <coughs> Is mutation the only way um, for species to evolve? No. No. Again, species evolve. I mean, for a, I mean, for evolution in general. Not no. necessarily for species. No. No, absolutely not. If 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 evolution is simply change over time, then we don't need anything novel for things to change. So we can throw natural selection into the definition of evolution. Natural selection is absolutely part of evolution, okay. right? The question is, are we, in, in order for evolution to function, do we need new types created by mutation the simple monster of mutation? Or is there sufficient variation innate? Innate in this case is created. Is there sufficient variation in the population itself that there's enough new types available to be selected on that when a new environmental condition <coughs> is, is perceived by the population, the population can change to fit the new environment? In other words, acorns versus fruit or insect. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Okay. So, what are the odds of mutations? Let's play math for just a second. Does anybody have any idea how often we make mistakes, life on planet that's reproducing its DNA? How often are mistakes made? Calculated rate, 10 to the 7th power. One mistake is made for every, somebody give me the number of 10 to the 7th. 10 million? One in every 10 million replications a mistake is made. How many mistakes have to be made 
for us to change something. More than one. Okay? You can't, if you have <coughs> one base pair of DNA, a human has, can you how many base pairs of DNA is in there in a human cell? She knows. <laughs> I knew three, it was done. Three billion. <laughs> base pairs of DNA per cell is the average, okay? We've got three billion base pairs of DNA. If we make one mistake out of every 10 million replications of DNA, and that mistake makes no difference, what are the odds that we're going to come up with something new that's good? Oh, it doesn't, wait, wait. It, it, it doesn't even have to be good. It just has to make it into the population. And it has to be recognized. So in, in, order for, in order for a mutational event to actually cause something new to happen, and we've got this complex structure of DNA. Okay. We've got to beat this. We've got to have at least I'm gonna be nice. I'm gonna say I'm gonna say we need three changes out of those three billion base pairs to come up with a mutational event that will change something. Somebody know how to do that multiplication for me? Ten to the twenty first. Somebody wanna come up with that number for me? The, the point is very simple. It doesn't happen. Okay? There's, 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 there's observable mathematical improbability of that ever occurring. But that's why there's going to be an emphasis on time. you got to have huge periods of time for the model war. And the huge periods of time become so huge in my lifetime, Sam, in my lifetime, we've gone from an Earth that was expected to be two billion years old to how old now? How many? Seven, seven and a half billion years is what we're now saying the age of the Earth is. And the reason we're doing that is because of this dilemma right here. Okay? But, if, if the two models are, rather than being opposing one another, they are working in unison, and the created type had sufficient variability for the evolution to work on, and we didn't need the time to create all these new mutations, God created <coughs> enough genes and enough variation that all of the observable events of evolution that are used by the evolutionists to, to extrapolate to the beginning of time, there was sufficient variation that God put in place when he created his kind to produce all of the observable evolution. And suddenly the argument of needing an earth that's seven billion years old goes away completely and it's okay to believe I'm not saying I do but it's okay to believe a calculated age of the earth of 6,000 years 10,000 which would be genealogically representable in the scriptures <coughs> Geological evidence for a seven billion year old planet? Or for a six thousand year old planet? There is geological evidence of years and years and years of sedimentation. Okay? It's very difficult to put a time on it. And and 
geology professor will kill me for making this statement, but, but you cannot make a circular argument. I can't use something that I'm trying to prove to prove. Okay? So, if we take the geologic record, we have what are called index fossils. Okay? Index fossils say, if I find this trilobite, uh, let, me, let me move it away now. I find this trilobite in the Cambrian, <coughs> then the rock that I found it in is Cambrian age rock. Because we know the trilobites were Cambrian. How do I know that Cambrian age rock is Because it has trilobites in it. Exactly. And that is the circularity of the entire dating of the geologic record. We use index fossils to name the type of rock, but the types of rocks were named based on the index fossils they contained. It's, it's, it's a purely circular argument that, that anyone... That, is it useful? Absolutely, it's useful because we can name lots of rock types and we can name lots of periods pre Cambrian, Cambrian, Ordovician, Pennsylvania, Mississippi, all of those geologic times, okay, are, are named based on the organisms that were living at that time. So it's useful. But is it truthful? I would argue it's not. You got a question on your brain there, Stan? Well, no, I think you can, you're, what you're saying is basically it's a, if you can use it as an index, you just can't use it to date things. That's exactly what I'm saying. That's exactly what I'm saying. And, and, and what we've done, or what we've allowed to happen, is we've allowed these index fossils to, to be used as dating mechanisms and they fail because of the circularity of their origins. Okay, so let's go back. When we started, I, I talked to you about, and, and I had someone read, thank you for doing that, by the way, the account of creation, okay, from the Bible. What was, what, what's the text? What's the Bible of the evolutionist? Hmm? Origin of the species. Say that one slowly for me one more time. Origin of the species. <laughs> Someone else want to try that? <laughs> the origin of species. Not the species. Okay. Back to our time period. He was looking for and thought he'd come upon how new species arise. And, and, he, and he did so. He, he very convincingly shows that over time new species are formed. The reason I'm picking on you on the the is most people think the species that Darwin was working with was humans. Okay, and he and he wrote this this <coughs> treatise on how did humans occur. It's, nothing's further from the truth of what Darwin was thinking. Okay. We have sufficient variation and sufficient time for new species to have arisen in observable time. I gave you the example of the Drosophila, okay? That one's not easy to observe, but it's very, very believable because we've got enough recent data to verify it. How long did that take? The Drosophila? Less than 100 years from when the, from when the Drosophila
colonized a new island. I'll give you I'll give you another example, a real example. I'll be at another entomological example. Okay, there's a, a another fly that lives on rotting apples. Okay, genus Ragolitus. And there was no Ragolitus that lived on rotten apples in the New World. But Europeans brought apples with them and planted apples. Okay? So we now have Ragolitus imported into a new environment and on eating, eating on domesticated apples where they were found in Europe. Okay? They, get to be, they get to what's now the United States and they branch out and start using other fruit. Okay? From when we were called, when, when the Europeans colonized the United States to the early 1960s, there were no fewer than three genera of Ragolitas in the United States, all with, dis, all being descendants of those ones that were first imported. They no longer breed with one another, and they use different fruits as their primary food source. That's, that's fast evolution. They no longer do or no longer can? What? Breed. Interbreed, good, I mean. Good, good question. Um, and I don't know that we know the answer to that. They no longer do okay. because they, they are specific to either fresh or rotting fruit from different plants. But the, the, the fruit fly, they cannot. They cannot. No, in this scenario, they, I mean, they, they, are, they are incapable of producing viable Do they ever try? They? I mean, in the oh, wild, do they, they, they... These have been taken into labs and been tried to force to reproduce, okay. and, and they, they, they're incapable. Okay. There is there is now a reproductive barrier between them. When collected there. Yeah. Again, all that example does is blow Ernst Meyer's definition of species. I get, I was just trying to get back to this idea of how many mistakes does it make to cause a change of that magnitude where they cannot. Well, breed anymore, where they can't produce offspring anymore. There, there's Do we evidence, know? There's certainly, if, if we talk about gross mistakes in genetic reproduction, they cause immediate or can cause immediate um, reproductive, reproductive inviability. Okay? For example, in plants, some of the hybrids that we have in plants, you have, you have doubling of the entire genetic material, okay? So instead of being a diploid, it becomes a tetraploid or a dodecaploid. It's got tons of DNA in there. And when you start crossing those, is, is everybody with me when I say diploid, tetraploid, or do I need to explain that? Okay? Explain it to me, I'm an idiot. Okay. <laughs> Normally we have, in, in life systems that we're familiar with with DNA, we have Diploid. We have one set of DNA from mama and one set of DNA from papa. So that's a diploid number. If we had tetraploid, we got two from each. Two complete sets. One, one set being sufficient to create the organism. Okay? Two sets being the normal redundancy or the diploidism. Okay? Four sets being some gross error that was made. And we have plants that have multiple, multiple sets. Okay, and they have this unbelievably mixed up DNA structure. And they can't breed <coughs> you know, immediately if, if, the, if the amount of DNA, the number of chromosomes, goes from being 10 to 20. When you cross a 10 by a 20, they, everything falls apart because the machinery just fails. That you, because of reproduction, you, you have to be able to pair up DNA right. in order for a successful cell division. Right? So common errors, <coughs> great gross errors, like trisomy, okay, of a chromosome being three copies, okay, um, 
cause immediate reproductive issues unless, well, when you're an odd number, it never works. Okay? Because you can't, you can't equally pair odd numbers, right? But tetraploid can work, but if you cross a diploid by a tetraploid, you end up with a triploid and then you have a problem. So my answer, did I get to your, answer your question? Well, I guess I'm just wondering how many, how many mutations does it take between those two populations of fruit flies before they cannot? Uh, do we know? Uh, we don't know. Okay. We don't know. Um, actually, we may know now. We, we probably they've probably sequenced all that. I don't know. Okay. But I mean, like I said, the sequences have to match perfectly, more or less. Well. No, they don't. For Reaper, no. no, they don't. Uh, and and that, that inherent created variation. You know, the, the, the whole argument here is with evolution, for most evolutionists, <coughs> is the variation required arose by random chance, which I think I blew that argument apart over here with mutation rates. Okay? So, so... If the new variation, if it has to be new variation, it doesn't happen. Okay? But if there's created variation sufficient so that when a new environmental situation is encountered by a population, it can evolve, it can change to meet that new environmental hurdle. That's evolution. So you're saying it's all natural selection? It's natural selection working on creative variation. Right. So it's all already there. Is what it's all already there. That's exactly right. So the finches that need to eat insects develop some long beak, but they already had it. They were already in there. The, the genes for the long beak were already in the yeah. population. The, the genetic retention, in other words. The genetic variation <laughs> required to make a long beak. It's like potential energy versus kinetic energy. Right. The, the, the energy's there, so you're... Oh, <laughs> oh, it's being scientific! Okay, so, so... You know, a lot of the discussion that Darwin does in The Origin of Species is based on what humans have done by pushing the envelope for selection. And we do it by breeding. We specifically, instead of letting natural selection be the force that causes the selection of traits, we humans cause the selection of traits that we want. We want fat pigs with bacon. We don't want skinny pigs. So we breed fat pigs with fat pigs, and we select for those genes that cause fat pigs, or full ears of corn, or probably the most explicit example that all of you are familiar with is dog breeds. Okay, how many different dogs are there out there, dog breeds, that we can recognize, and not only can we recognize them, but they breed true. Okay, breed Labrador, with Labrador you get Labrador. Breed Chihuahua, with Chihuahua you get Chihuahua. What do you get? Which, by the way, dogs are wolves. Okay? They were domesticated out of the wild wolves. They were selected by humans for certain characteristics that the humans wanted. Okay? And what the selection process did was reduce the variation in the population, the breed, <coughs> so that we just pulled out those traits that we wanted. So think about this for a second. When you breed, when you selectively outbreed breeds of dogs, what does the dog look like? I'll get to you. In other words, what does a stray dog look like? Scrappy. Scrappy? Has it got a short nose like a schnauzer? Really like long nose. They look like a wolf. Which is exactly what you'd expect. If all of the variation that we took existed in the population of wolves, the wild type, and we specifically selected it for certain characteristics, 
we can get rid of all of the variation and get it down to being a Dalmatian that's black with uh, that's white with black spots with a little shorter nose. But if we then reintroduce lots of variation from all these other dog species, we can recreate the wolf. And if you find a pack of stray dogs, they very quickly converge on being <coughs> wolf-like. Even though the parental of those wild dog packs could, could have been any number of dog species. And that's exactly what we'd expect if the inherent variation was in place as the created type. Question. Um, is that why there's different races of people? Like, if we have all been split up and stuff, like, we're basically all very similar, and there's nothing else really like us. Okay. I'll answer that question with, with a caveat, and that is I don't want to get into human evolution. Okay? But, going back to Genesis, um, we, had, we had the start, we had the creation, and then we had the restart after the flood. Right? And the restart after the flood, we had Ham and Shem and Japheth which were the sons of Noah, okay? And, and those three, three men are the progenitors of, and, and it's given to us in Genesis, the different areas of the world that the, by, by the name of the tribes that were spawned from those three. And we can, we can look at those and see different races, okay? Ham. Um, Ham was the progenitor of Cush, which is North Africa. Okay? Japheth is the progenitor of Magog, which is Russia. So, but based on that genealogy, those different races came out of those three sons of Noah. Okay? But, there was... The, unbelievable amount of variation that each of us has within us, if selected upon, okay, can produce all kinds of all kinds of unique populations. Thankfully it hasn't been done much with human selective breeding to breed for certain characteristics. But but it's certainly been done with Food plants, cows, pigs, horses, cats, dogs. I mean, we, we, we've used what we know about variation without really knowing. Most of the breeding was done prior to Mendel and his work with genetics and Watson and Crick, who explained it to us on how it works with the DNA. Okay, so the reason that doesn't happen to us is because we're so complex, like the fly thing. Reason what doesn't happen to us? That we're not, that we're still able to, no matter, like, if we're, that we've been split up. The, the, the reason this hasn't happened to humans is because there haven't been barriers to, to gene flow. This altitude caused a barrier of gene flow so that the only way the genes could flow was through migration. <coughs> and it took so long that mutational events, or they don't have to be mutational events, something caused gene frequency or mutational events caused the inability to interbreed. So for humans, um, humans, humans have this continuous, and they're not the only ones, wolves, wolves are another great example of being cosmopolitan they live on every continent, same Antarctica, and they they interbreed across those continents. Okay, so there's so there's constant gene flow. Now, are there human populations that are genetically distinct from one another? Absolutely. They they choose to select who they breed with. For example, the Jewish population in New York City tends to breed with other Jews 
from New York City. Not a bad thing, except that they start having some genetic problems because of their interbreeding. Okay, when I started my talk today, I said I wanted interaction, and I got very little. I also said I wanted a show of hands for whether anyone was willing to say they were an evolutionist or say they were a creationist. What I didn't say was, actually I did say I'm a creationist, but I'm also a Darwinian evolutionist. Didn't I say that? Mm -hmm. Oh. Does anybody think that those two things are mutually exclusive? So, so now everybody in the room agrees that I can be a Darwinian evolutionist and a born-again Christian believer in creationism. It goes back to presuppositions. Absolutely. Always. <coughs> I think it was presuppositions. Just, just got to make that clear for everybody. Yeah. But, but, you know, we can, we can talk about natural selection as a, it's almost a mechanical tool. And again, I, sorry, all I have is analogies and all that kind of stuff. Because I've got analogies this background. Good. Yeah. But you can talk about natural selection as a tool for accomplishing a purpose, if you will, or, you know, force. But that doesn't necessarily oh, force of nature. Yeah, which has its own set of issues, right? But um, but that doesn't preclude the presupposition that you can say there's still more of the universe than just the material world. We're just we're just making an observation about the material world. In the material world, there is. I, I, I'm I'm willing to make the presupposition that, however, life ended up on this planet. Is that's where life begins. If we, we can come up with theory after theory of, of aliens that sent rockets in, and quite frankly, it's interesting to see how a lot of evolutionists are, are leaning to those kind of theories because of the mathematics that, that blows holes in their theories if it's just here on this planet. Okay? But, but you haven't solved the problem, you've only removed it. You've step, only right? moved it out to some other extraterrestrial. Okay? You still have the problem of, okay, how did it get organized in the first place? And believe me, DNA is so incredibly complex that we can take this number 10 to the 21 and take it to 10 to the 21 billion, okay, a essentially infinite amount of time, you still can't. Which argues absolutely for a special creator. Now, is that the God of the Bible? We can have that argument, which is a totally different argument. But you can't get past the need for something other than time and randomness having created what we know is life on this planet. You just can't. So in your opinion, why do the secular evolutionists cling so desperately to their not their totally naturalistic origins there's there's a couple of reasons number one is the, the idea of mother nature okay that natural is better that natural is somehow God And the people that have picked up and have pushed evolution for generations now have specifically done so to avoid having to admit that there must be a God. And, and, the, and the theories 
that are raised, and I said this to you this morning, but we had, we had creationists. Creation wasn't argued against. Okay? There, there weren't competing theories on origins in, seven, in the 1750s when Linnaeus was, was building this hierarchy. Everybody knew that somewhere in there was the created type. Okay? Not until the middle of the 1800s did we start having these new ideas. And, and Darwin's ideas are the ones that prevailed. And we had them Darwinian evolutionists. And there's a whole series of scientists that picked up on Darwin's ideas. And Alfred Wallace's ideas, who, who basically came up with the same idea at the same time. Okay? Until we get to post Watson and Crick and Mendel's discovery of genetics. And then we started having problems with the Darwinian evolutionists. And we got what, what are termed neo-Darwinians. Okay? And they come in the form of Richard Dawkins and Stephen Jay Gould, who start tweaking the Darwinian theory because the mathematics don't work with mutations being what is driving evolution. So you get these, these wonderfully stupid ideas in my mind, like Stephen Gould's punctuated equilibrium, where he says the reason there's no transitional forms in the fossil record or in the geologic record is because evolution is not moving at a static rate. Rather, it moves in very, very, very short bursts of lots of change followed by very, very, very long periods of stasis, or unchanged. So he says, in punctuated equilibrium, we have lots of evolution, followed by lots of everything being the same, and then we get another burst of evolution. And since we have these long periods of change and these short periods of, I mean, these long periods of stasis and these short periods of change, there's very little record left of the changing periods. That was simply a way to make it work, because it obviously didn't. But Darwin's ideas were great, and they were. Survival of the spirit, the fittest, selection of good traits by environmental conditions. It worked. It's a great theory. It works. And it's absorbable. The big question is, where does the variation that's being selected upon come from? God created it. And the evidence of the complexity of DNA, if we just look at DNA, goes back to my example about Leonardo da Vinci. <coughs> How can you look at the variation? the complexity of the DNA and the life form and not just say it's obvious there's an artist. Yes, sir. Well, so you are, you know, we're talking about a younger theory, you know, 6,000 years, 8,000, something like that. Um, you said you didn't necessarily believe that. Um, so, like, what, how old, like, would you say, you know, that the Earth is and how would you reconcile that with um, the biblical account of creation and then like people saying, well, dinosaurs lived, you know, however many million years ago and um, Neanderthals and all that. Like, so what would, like, what's your opinion on that? You're not going to like my answer, but I'll give it. Okay. I have no idea how the earth is. And in my opinion, it, it becomes a, an irrelevant question mm -hmm. if we can see the mechanisms that are driving change. Okay? And if those mechanisms are sufficiently fast to allow for a young earth theory, I'm okay with the young earth. Okay? If they're sufficiently fast to allow for a young Earth theory, they still work in an old Earth theory. Okay? So, the mechanisms are those things. 
And the variation that, for example, Darwin saw in the finches, he wasn't around long enough to actually observe them changing, but his observations and his conclusions are absolutely accurate as to what happened, in my opinion. And there's been plenty of time, even with a young Earth scenario, for that to occur. I will argue absolutely that the reason the earth continues to get older is because of people that are unwilling to say there is any created type. That's why we have old earth here, is because it doesn't fit evolution if it's any younger. And evolution in that definition is biochemical evolution from the beginning with no life to the current complexity of life. So did I understand you to say that that kind of argument has really only developed since Watson and Crick developed, uh, you know, told us about DNA? Yeah, that, that's when we started, not, not just Watson and Crick, but, but, but Mendelian genetics and when we started understanding the, the nuance of heredity, and, and we could start looking at some of these ideas of, of traits being passed into the future and do something about how they were passed into the future. Um, then we started getting the, the Carl Sagan and the Stephen Gould and the Richard Dawkins that tweet through the theory to keep it alive. I think for context, you need to add a note that Gould and Dawkins represent that new atheism that's so hostile to. Theism, and so just again for truth and advertising right. to understand. Is, is there meaning in keeping the theory alive by adding tweaks to it, like punctuating equilibrium? What's their purpose? And I think you're absolutely right. It's, it's to say there is no God. That's why they want to keep it alive. If I could be. One of the purposes, and this is something that uh, Mr. Ward and I have discussed multiple times, is to try to get our students to come away from Brook Hill with some sort of anchor, if you will, that when they're confronted in a college classroom by people who are obviously very intelligent and have their own set of beliefs that they're very committed to, and come at them with all kinds of different evidence. You know, I mean, you're going to have a geneticist come at them with some sort of evidence of why evolution is true. A geologist is going to come from a different angle. All that biology is going to come from a different angle. Can you maybe come up with some, and I'm springing this on you out of the blue, I recognize, but something to just kind of hold on to and say, okay, no matter what else, what all this other scientific evidence exists, you know, what can I walk away from here saying, I can trust that there is a creator because? I'm going to answer your question by telling an anecdotal story, sort of. Okay. okay. And that is, now before I get to the anecdotal story, let me ask you a question. What is salvation? Wow, how do we get from evolution to salvation? <laughs> what is uh, salvation is being reconciled to God. Being reconciled to God through Christ. Christ Jesus. Did we say anything about what we believed about creation or evolution? Is, is there a requirement there? No. No. Okay. So, so my, my, my salvation is dependent on my relationship with Christ, knowing that I am the sinner and I am incapable, incapable of having a relationship with God short of Christ. When you get to college and you've got professors that are married to evolution and long earth, if you say to them or your contemporary students that you must believe creationism in order to be saved? <clears throat> First off, that's a lie. Second off, if you tell them you've got to believe creationism and then you want to talk to them about Christ, 
they're going to look at you and say you're an idiot because I know evolution. I know what happened. I know it's fact. And if you want me to give up my belief in that fact, then your ability to witness to that party is gone. Okay? I, 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 I've been down this road, okay, where, where I had opportunities to present the gospel, and I lost those opportunities because I thought creationism was so important to my Christian walk. You with me? Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's not salvific. And there's lots of there's lots of different trails that you can get drug on, which is why I use the example with this young man about driving. It's very easy to be led astray unless you take thoughts captive and compare them to the scripture and see if they fit. Right. We're out of time. Yeah. All right, thank you.